second one. We're going to be studying tonight on the justice of God. The justice of God. And we're going to use Genesis 3 as our scripture text. And you can just take some notes along there as we go through this lesson. And uh, trust that it will be a blessing to each one of us. Now, next Sunday morning, we'll be having a baptismal service. Lolita Shroud came this morning to, uh, to submit for baptism. So next Sunday morning, she'll follow the Lord in scriptural baptism. Next Sunday night, then we'll be having our birthday and anniversary fellowship uh, after the evening service. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother Mildred, I, I meant to talk to you and Karen earlier. <laughs> it's harder to say no in the service. <laughs> but I'm wondering if the WMU might be our hostess, hostesses next Sunday night. You, now, I'm not putting you on the spot. Uh, believe me, I'm just asking. So if you and Karen could get together, and all you do is recognize those who have birthdays and anniversaries, and just tell us about your ministry, about the WMU program and, and what you're doing and some things like that next Sunday night. That'd be great if you could. All right. Amen. We have so many things going on all the time. It's hard to cover all the bases. <laughs> uh, and then also next Sunday morning, uh, Lord willing, we'll be having a baby dedication service. Little Andrew Madison Robert Shook. That's a mouthful. <laughs> it's going to be publicly dedicated unto the Lord. So uh, uh, we're looking forward to that. And if you know of anybody that has a small child, a baby, that they'd like to dedicate publicly to the Lord God, uh, to Jesus, uh, we'll do that next Sunday morning. And, and, of course, we know that it's just as much, if not more so, a parental dedication than it is the child dedication because the parents are promising to raise the child to the glory of God. Genesis chapter 3 a very, very familiar portion of Scripture. Now, uh, tell us some favorite chapters of the Bible real quickly. Very, and familiar chapters of the Bible. Of course, the most familiar. That's right. Psalm 23. The Bluegrass Brother was saying about that this morning. But what else? The Lord. Okay. Matthew 6, I believe it is. All right. And that's the John 3 then chapter, right? Because that's a verse. But, amen. Psalm 91, okay. Psalm 100, 1 John 1, okay. If we walk in the light, right. Ecclesiastes 3, and what, what does that say? Something about the a time to reap and a time to sow. Amen. That's good, Brother Merle. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about uh, 1 Corinthians 13? Anybody know what that is? That's a love chapter. That's right. Mildred? Oh, you were going to say that. Okay. Okay. Galatians 2. Okay, and that's my life's verse. And uh, Genesis 3 has to be a great chapter of the Bible too, doesn't it? Because it tells us of the fall of man. The Bible does teach total depravity of mankind. In other words, that there's nothing good about us that the only thing good is God and uh, that uh, there's nothing good about ourselves, that we're totally depraved. As a matter of fact, Isaiah said that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So we must depend upon God's righteousness to be accepted of God rather than our own because we don't have any righteousness in ourselves. And Genesis 3 tells how that mankind got into such a mess. This is where it all started when sin entered into the human race. Now, uh, Satan had already fallen, so sin had entered the universe through him, but uh, mankind had not be, been touched by sin until uh, chapter 3. Let's read just a little bit of it. It says, Now the serpent, in verse 1 there, uh, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now I want you to notice how that he didn't come right out and say, You're not to do this, or you're not... He asked a question because he was sowing doubt. He's very deceitful, isn't he? He's very subtle, and so he asked a question. He tries to get the woman to question God. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now this is a, an interesting statement because... Uh, we don't find any place where God said they weren't to touch it. He said not to eat of it. So the woman here was guilty of adding to the Word of God. But when we take the Word of God, we're not to add to it, and we're not to take away from it, are we? 
We're to take it as God gives it to us. And that gets us into trouble when we add to the Word of God. And uh, then it says, The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now he gets bold and says, You won't die. He first asked the question. Now he's coming right out and saying, You aren't going to die. In other words, he's saying, uh, Going completely blatantly against God. Uh, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods. Small g, knowing good and evil. And when the uh, woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And there you have the three ways that Satan tempts us. The lust of the eyes, said to look at it, the lust of the flesh was to take of it, and the pride of life. First John 2, 15 talks about that, those three areas. And uh, the pride of life is seen there in that statement that you'll be as gods, you'll be made desired to make one wise. And then she took of the fruit, and she gave it to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, this is an interesting scripture because uh, God created Adam, as you recall, from the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and the Bible says that man became a living soul. That's the only one of creation that the Bible says that he became a living soul. And Adam had named the animals. They were male and female, the animal kingdom was, but he was all by himself. And so God said it is not good for the man to be alone. He caused Adam to go to sleep. He took the rib from his side right by his heart. And uh, it's interesting, he didn't take the bone from his feet for the man to walk on her or from from his head to where she would be his boss. (laughs) But he took the bone from the heart, right by the heart, to where there'd be love. See? (laughs) You notice how you can tell where the people say amen is what they want. (laughs) What they're wanting to hear. (laughs) But... uh, it's interesting that he took that bone right from the heart, by the heart, to where there was to be love in the relationship. So he put Adam and Eve together, and the Bible says that the two became one flesh. And so here they are, the two. And, I, and it's interesting, too, to, to know here that uh, Adam didn't really have much choice. I mean, he didn't, wasn't able to choose his wife. There's only one. <laughs> I mean, and God made her for him. But in a sense, I believe God does make the mate for each one of us uh, if we'll let the Lord in his time bring the right person to us but there there was no choice I mean God said here she is Adam <laughs> he wasn't gonna look at <laughs> I mean this was the one this was the one for Adam but God made her just for him isn't that great and uh, now of course when a, uh, to choose a mate uh, you have to wait on the Lord and really seek out the Lord's guidance in that because it'd be a lot better not to be married than to marry the wrong person, you see, and uh, have a lot of heartaches uh, from that uh, relationship. It must be in the Lord's will. But God put them together in the garden, and uh, this relationship, they were together, and she took of the forbidden fruit, and she gave it to him, and he took of the forbidden fruit, and as a result, mankind had fallen into sin, and their eyes were open. Now, to this point, they did not recognize sin. They were innocent. They were naked, but they didn't. There was no uh, no lust in the relationship. They did not lust after each other. Uh, they, they were innocent, but as soon as they sinned, then they began to have that ability to lust, uh, to realize they were naked, and they 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 realized that it was wrong. And uh, it, it talks about how that then uh, the beautiful picture of Christ here that uh, uh, there was a sacrifice and God clothed, them. and that's what happened when Christ died on the cross. And, were clothed through his righteousness. Now, let's look at our outline and just kind of get a few of these thoughts. Now, God frequently met with men in Scripture, uh, especially in the Old Testament. Can you think of anybody right off the top of your head besides uh, here with Adam and Eve that God met with personally in the, in the Bible? Moses. That's one of the first ones that comes to my mind. Moses. You remember the burning bush? How it burned, but it was not consumed, and God spoke to him right from the bush? Who's someone else? Noah, all right. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Elisha, is that who he said, or Elijah? Elisha, all right. Who else? Who was the one who wrestled? Okay, Jacob. You remember that? Jacob. And who was the friend of God? 
Who was called the friend of God? Abraham. Yes. And God met with these various ones. Amen. And uh, these, these come to my mind too uh, right away. Moses especially and Jacob and Abraham but uh, these others as well. Now, um, he met with these people and from this encounter we can learn the great truth of God's justice. Justice. Because in justice, uh, when we look at the justice of God, it takes the holiness of God. God is a holy God. He cannot look at sin and wink at sin and let sin go unpunished. Sin has to be dealt with because God is holy. But then when we look at justice, we also find the mercy of God and the love of God. All of these things enter into it. Because it's through uh, Christ paying for our sin that we are born again. You see, God's holiness demanded Christ to die on the cross to make the sin payment. And when we receive the Lord and become children of God, God is still just as holy and just as just as ever because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us on Calvary. So let's look at this first thing. Justice is always based on individual responsibility. Now, look at verses 11 through 13, and we see that Adam and Eve used a blame shift defense. <laughs> let's look here. Verse 11, And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman. <laughs> now, uh, not only though was he blaming the woman, he was blaming God. Did you get that? Because it said, The woman you gave me. So when we actually, when we blame somebody else for a predicament we're in, we're really actually blaming God. And we ought to be careful about that. That the woman that you gave me, she gave me all the, uh, of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, now he looks for the woman and he says, Now, Eve, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, what did she say? <laughs> That's right, the devil, do you remember that? The devil made me do it. That, uh, well, she said, the serpent beguiled me. At least she admitted that he, you know, she, he got the best there. I mean, she was, at least she wasn't so proud and said, well, <laughs> he, he did it. But he, she admitted that he got the best of her. And she said, I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, and here's the pronouncement of, of justice, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And so he takes care of the serpent and then goes on. But let's, let's dwell here a little bit further. Adam and Eve used the blame shift defense in verses 11 through 13. But God ignored that defense. It didn't hold water like the old saying goes. It didn't hold water. Uh, it just didn't work. You just can't blame somebody else for the situation that you're in. I mean, we must accept personal responsibility. And I have a saying that goes like this. Uh, responsibility requires accountability. Whatever responsibility I have as a as a man, as a, a husband, a father, a pastor, uh, a, a citizen of this nation, I'm going to have to give an account unto God for all of my responsibility. So the more that a person has his responsibility, the greater accountability that person has. Many times we look at somebody and say, my, well, they have it easy, and, and it looks easy, and so on, and uh, of course, like with the Bluegrass Brethren, of course, I used to do some traveling with uh, my brother and families and so on in music, and, and uh, I come in afterwards, and I said, this is the glamorous part of being in this kind of business, and they had to pick up all the uh, microphones and, and instruments and pack them all up, put them in the trailer, <laughs> and they've got it down pretty good after 17 years, but uh, that, there's a lot of work to that that a lot of people don't even know about. They just don't, they don't think about that. But when you're in a business, then, you know, you understand that. Uh, so, but each one of us must accept responsibility and then we're going to give an account for that before the Lord one day. And so God deals with each individual as if each were totally to blame. And blame is often shared, of course. There, was, there were more than one involved in this situation, but each one of them was to blame. Serpent, Adam, Eve, all of them were to be of blame in this. 
And uh, blame can't be shifted, can't blame somebody else, must accept it for ourselves. So justice is always based on individual responsibility. And we need a reawakening of that in America, where people will accept responsibility for their own actions. If we could only get people to do that, if, we, if people would not blame someone else for their situation, it would be so, so much better. We'd all be so much better off. And so we just need to learn that lesson, and God teaches it here, how that justice is based on individual responsibility. Secondly, in God's Word, justice, the justice of God, always does what is promised or threatened. In other words, God never lies. When God says something, He means it. God says what He means, means what He says. And uh, we better recognize that. It's for our welfare that we recognize that. So God indeed had spoken. We're going to look in chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17 here. Chapter 2 uh, verses 16 and 17 it says, and the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden. Now so he's speaking to the man here, right? Because uh, he hadn't even didn't even have anybody else with him yet. He was by himself. <laughs> so God spoke. In other words, God told Adam this before Eve was even around. So there's a possibility that he may have thrown in something. You know, when she said that, uh, told the serpent, neither touch it. You know, it's possible, but whether uh, we assume that she added that on herself, but uh, she had to have gotten the word, uh, we believe, from Adam, you know, that they weren't supposed to eat of that fruit, uh, of that uh, tree. But uh, here we see that uh, God told Adam, uh, every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So there's a restriction on that one tree. Isn't that amazing? If, if you take a child and uh, bring him into a room and you say, now, honey, don't touch that. Probably that child wouldn't have even thought of it if you hadn't put it in their mind. Isn't that right? So it's better not to say anything until they start to go for it. And then say something. <laughs> That's just human nature. Take a child away and say, now, don't do that. or don't." And, and sometimes they, they wouldn't even thought of it otherwise. So Adam was given this restriction. And, he, and it seems like that's what happens a lot of times. And the prohibition was simply that in the day that thou doest it, thou shalt surely die. In other words, they would die spiritually immediately. They'd be separated from God, driven from the garden, and they'd begin to die physically. They'd begin to age and, and, and they would die physically because of sin. And that's found there in the scripture we just read. Now this was exactly what happened. God did not fail to follow through. Uh, when there is such failure, it always leads to problems. Uh, you see, God, when he says something, he doesn't make idle threats. And we can learn so much from God in our uh, disciplining children. Uh, God uh, d d doesn't make idle threats. And, it, and it's, I think it's poor, bad when we keep uh, threatening our child. And uh, we sometimes provoke them to anger. Uh, I think it's better to, like Teddy Roosevelt, speak softly and carry a big stick. That's kind of like what my grandfather did. <laughs> Except he had a razor strap <laughs> instead of a stick. Uh, but... Uh, God, when he speaks, he means it. It's not an idle threat. He means it. So justice always does what is promised or threatened. And uh, then we notice thirdly that justice always suits the punishment to the crime. Okay? You do the crime, you're going to have to do the time, somebody said. Uh, now, uh, look here that each must deal or be dealt with individually. We saw that here in chapter 3 in verses 14 through 19. God dealt with the serpent and then the woman, and then the man. Look at uh, the woman, he said, and this is beautiful in verse 15 of chapter 3. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. Now here is the first prophecy of Christ coming to die on the cross. You may not see it there, but it's there. And thou shalt bruise his heel. Now here it is. The enmity between thee and the woman, the serpent and the woman, in other words, Satan, and between thy seed, serpent seed, and a woman's seed, which would be Jesus, it shall bruise thy head. The seed of the woman would bruise the head of the seed of the serpent, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The seed of the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, and that literally happened on the cross. When Christ died on the cross, 
he had to be bruised. His heel was literally bruised, but uh, figuratively, spiritually also, he was bruised because he had to die and shed his blood uh, in our place. So that that's the first prophecy of Christ coming. Genesis 3, verse number 15. Beautiful prophecy. And then in verse 16, under the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. So here's childbirth. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou uh, return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So even uh, the fact that when we die, our body returns dust to dust, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, uh, that's found here in this scripture. Uh, but we t go back to the dust, and uh, in uh, biological studies, the same thing's found in dirt, it's found in our bodies. Did you know that? <laughs> exactly the same things. And how true it is. This whole body's nothing but a bunch of dirt. <laughs> Little water moisture mixed in there, but I mean, uh, the same chemicals. <laughs> and uh, years ago, they used to have a study in science that they figured how much the body was worth. Now, that was back years ago, you know. I think it's a dollar something. Inflation probably worth more than that now, but just 65? 2.65. Well, thank you. $2.65. So when you get to thinking a lot of yourself, just remember you're worth about 265 <laughs> as far as the chemicals or whatever it is in the body. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm sure you will. <laughs> Amen. Okay. But now, uh, God always tailors the justice for the situation, for the crime. Uh, he deals with it individually, and each received punishment worthy of the crime, no more, and no less. Now, in our justice system, of course, uh, mankind is not perfect, and it, do it doesn't always turn out that way. I think we have about the best system. You know, we, uh, it's better than anything else, anyway, and uh, uh, the best system that we can have. But in God's system, He's perfect. He sees the heart, and He knows the motivation, everything about it. So His justice is always perfect to the uh, crime. And so real justice always involves balance. Now, let's go over to Acts 10 verse 34. And whoever finds that first, I'll have you read it. Whoever finds it first. We'll have a sword drill. Acts 10, chapter 10, verse 34. No, any version that you have. If you have it memorized, that's all right too. And that, in the King James Version, or does somebody have it open too? just says okay so you see yeah. we're all looked at the same by God and that just helps uh, open it up to us uh, the living Bible too so nobody's a favorite of God he loves us all his justice is the same for everybody he's no respecter of persons so there's always balance in his justice and that's great. I'm glad that he accepted the rest of us, not just the Jews, but all of us, that by the blood of Christ, he has paid for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Regardless of race, regardless of, of our ages or our vocations or anything else. Thank God. And then finally, justice always mixes mercy with judgment. Now, God's judgment always includes mercy. Now, we've defined mercy before. Mercy keeps us from what we deserve. It's God's mercy. And then we've talked about grace, how that's God giving us what we do not deserve. Uh, so here's God's mercy mixed in with, the, uh, with justice. See, God's judgment always includes mercy. Even Satan received a measure of mercy. The man and the woman found mercy. Even though Satan could not be converted, like you and I can be, there was some mercy mixed in there in God's judgment. The man and the woman found mercy and Mercy is seen in the clothing them with the skins. Let's look at chapter 3 and verse 21 where it says, Unto Adam also 
and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. So uh, right there is the first animal sacrifice, the first shedding of blood, a picture that Christ would shed his blood for us and that his righteousness would be applied to us. And that's what happens when we receive Christ as Lord and Savior. God takes the coats of skin, the, the righteousness of God, and applies it to us, and covers us with His righteousness. And I'm so glad He does. And He forgives us of all of our sin. And then we see that we're far, uh, we are far, far wiser to operate on mercy than on judgment. Have you ever heard anybody say, I just want what I deserve? They don't really know what they're saying. Because I know what I deserve. And uh, I don't want that. I want the mercy of God. Now, and, and I can have the mercy of God and the justice of God at the same time because of the blood of Christ. The blood will never lose its power. Now, don't ask for what you have coming. God, as you may get it. <laughs> but get it. We don't want that. Now, chastisement is justice and repentance calls on mercy. Uh, now, there's a difference between punishment and chastisement. There's a difference. Don't ever punish your children. Don't ever do that. There's a lot of difference between punishment and chastisement. We should chastise our children, not punish them. Punishment is what God gives to the lost. Eternal punishment is what they earn from, uh, from uh, what the sin brings on a person. But chastisement is what God does to his who? Children. And he said, as many as I love... I rebuke and what? Chasten. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. So when, when, when we're spanked by God, that means He loves us. He wants to bring us back to Himself uh, for our welfare. So chastisement is justice. Repentance calls on mercy. Thus it is merciful to call sin by its real name. It's sin. It's uh, unrighteousness. And then the justice of God is nothing to fool with. Let's keep that in mind tonight as we conclude this. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1 where the question was asked by the serpent. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. And uh, he outright come out and said in verse 4, Ye shall not surely die. But God had told Adam, In the day that you eat of that fruit, ye shall surely die. Now may I ask, did they die? They did, didn't they? God's word is always true. And so, don't believe a lie. Satan is the father of the lie. But believe the truth, because God is truth. He cannot lie. It's impossible, according to Hebrews 6, 19 and 20, it is impossible for God to lie. He's always truth. The way, the truth, and the life. So, thank God for the justice of God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. We're so glad to be able to just open the Bible together and study from His Word. Let's look to the Lord together.